All right. Um, good afternoon. I did it right. <laughs> and welcome to uh, this week's episode of Encompass Live. Um, I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live uh, every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but um, usually at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, but if you um, and if but we do record the show every week as we are doing today, and so if you cannot watch the show live, you can always watch our recordings. Um, they are posted later onto our website, and I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access our recordings. We post the show recordings as well as any slides or handouts or documentation that uh, presenters do um, use. So these slides you're watching today, you'll have access to them as well um, as the recording. Um, after uh, the show. Um, the show, um, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the shows we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you who are not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So similar to your state library. Um, so we provide services and programs and resources and grants to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries. Uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives. Um, really, our only criteria is something to do with libraries in, in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> um, we have book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. We also bring in, we bring guest speakers to talk on Encompass Live sometimes, um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations for us, and that is what we have today. Um, today is the last Wednesday of the month, so it is Pretty Sweet Tech Day. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> that is when Amanda Sweet, who is our um, technology innovation librarian here at the commission. Good afternoon, Amanda. Good. I almost said morning, too. You yeah, I know. It's habit. <laughs> um, for those of you wondering, you know, those of you who are here know, but anyone watching us for recording, um, for this particular show, um, normally we do broadcast a show at 10 a.m. Central Time, but today, due to just some conflicts, we um, bumped it to the afternoon. So we're broadcasting this one live at actually 1.30 p.m. Central Time. So uh, hopefully we'll won't be um, get a little yeah, confused. Never tell them to <laughs> it's habit. It to be a morning. <laughs> yeah. um, but it is still the last Wednesday of the month, and every last Wednesday of the month, Amanda Sweet does her pretty sweet tech sessions. Um, so if you're a tech person or into tech at libraries, it's definitely the one to um, sign, show up for, or sign up for. Um, we do do techie related things at other times during the month too, um, just depending on what we've got for speakers. But you can always depend on the last Wednesday of the month will be Amanda sharing something with us. And um, today she's gonna be talking about the most recent computers and libraries conference, which happened in March and she did attend. And did you, you present it as well this year? Yeah. yeah. Um, and she's going to tell us all about all the cool, fun, interesting things she learned about at Computers and Libraries this year. There was so much shiny stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's always lots of shiny. I've attended Computers and Libraries before myself uh, many times. And it's um, a companion conference, I don't know, um, internet librarian that used to be held in um, California, Computers and Libraries is in Washington, D.C. on the East Coast. Um, and they always have lots of shiny, good, fun things yeah. that you can well, and learn a lot from, yeah. And it seems like in past years, like internet librarian and computers and libraries had a lot more overlap, but now that's starting to change mm -hmm. a lot more. Like they're yeah. starting to shift so that they're distinctly different. And so like internet librarian is virtual and as far as i know it's going to be virtual going forward and it seems that way yeah they yeah. they i know with um when the pan the covid 19 pandemic started they both went virtual yeah. um and now computers and libraries has gone um back to being hybrid correct yeah yeah, yeah. well yeah. this one was all in person they didn't okay. have the sessions recorded and I wasn't sure if it was going to be hybrid or if it was going to be all just in-person stuff. And this one was in-person. 
Uh, okay, so it's computers and libraries in the spring so, in DC yeah. in person, and then Internet Librarian, which is always traditionally in October timeframe, um, and yeah. was in um, on the West Coast, is now seems to be just it's going to be their virtual one going forward. Yeah. Yep. Which honestly, it's nice to have options for people. Yes, so definitely. cool. There's, I'm so glad there is. Um, I always like the fact that there was two conferences, one on each coast, because you know you can decide yeah. to split down yeah. the country. And like you said, things were a lot of things were repeated on each side, which I think made sense because you know, half the country go east, half go west, and at least yeah. you don't miss out on anything. Um, I know I presented the same presentation multiple times for the East Coast people and the West Coast people. Um, right. But now the way we can do things virtually, um, just like this show, it doesn't matter. Coasts yeah. don't matter anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you can go to everything. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so but tell in, us about what you did, you know, what happened at uh, CIL this year. So in CIL, um, I kind of plucked through and grabbed these different themes. So whenever I go to a conference, I always go between kind of the evergreen themes that are just probably going to be there every single mm -hmm. time. So the CIL always has something for revamping your website what are the new trends that you can do to build like hybrid environment make your website better we're always going to need that so i call those the evergreens so i'm not going to cover the evergreen trends today um you can mm -hmm. go on their website and you can pretty much find all of that on there but i kind of plucked out some of the new stuff that i found and so brian pitchman and i we usually do like a games and gadgets thing so this time I brought like a suitcase full of robots and I like being able to say suitcase full of robots and we set up the games and gadgets stuff so people that, could actually That's a little some... scary, I think, right? possibly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Brian's been doing it forever. I've only <laughs> yeah. ducked, like ducked in for the last few years of it, but yeah, he's been doing that forever. And so it was kind of fun to see people actually get to interact and engage with the like, you want to see and hold a robot in your hand before you actually get comfortable wanting to get it. So that's one of the things that we started doing. And one of the things that I like to do with it is um, there were a lot of different trends and sessions on AI. Like AI is everywhere. That's not going to be surprising for you. But mm -hmm. sort of the reason that I made it a separate trend instead of an evergreen trend is because this one introduced new concepts and kind of looked at AI from different perspectives. Hmm. So it's going to be evergreen in probably five or 10 years from now, but it's still new now. Oh yeah. And then also Let's the- kind of Figure out what to do with it. And it's the same thing with the metaverse. So the metaverse, for those who don't know, is when you put on the virtual reality headset, you're entering the metaverse. But you can also, it's kind of building out that virtual world that you can interact and explore in. And the metaverse is opening up all new opportunities for library, for both the library, their community, and the organizations within the community. And so libraries are experimenting with both AI and the metaverse and other emerging technologies to see what can happen there. And so that kind of bleeds into the next trend, which is that as technology gets more advanced and we find new ways to do stuff, the types of jobs in libraries are changing and the mm -hmm. types of skills that librarians and library supporters need are changing. And the way that management happens, like how do you manage in a virtual world? If you go build a hybrid environment and you start building a virtual reality library, how do you manage your staff both in a virtual reality library and the physical space? and kind of that hybrid world. So it's getting trippy people mm. and we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> and so then that turns into, if libraries are going to be using all of this new technology and learning all this new technology, then we kind of want to develop services that ask people to use this technology to do good stuff. How are you going to use this stuff to address like affordable housing? How are you going to make how are you going to use tech to make your community stronger? And how can you design and build out library services that support that? And then that bleeds over into community building. Um, the library is not going to have all of the answers to do this right now. Like 
no librarian is going to know everything about AI, the metaverse, and supporting entrepreneurs and supporting innovation and supporting tech for good. So community building is how can the library know and understand who in their community or in the wider world is able to help with that? How do you build out partnerships to tackle all this hard, complex stuff that's starting to build out? And then the next one is that, and the last one in the themes that I have for this session is DEI is diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, that's in like every conference everywhere, or at least it should be. But so kind of mo what most people think about with DEI is race, ethnicity, you want diversity of perspective, diversity of opinion. But I kind of plucked out some of the other different underrepresented groups that we don't always think about in terms of DEI. Mm -hmm. So there we go. It definitely can be bigger than that, yeah. Yeah. So the first one is you've probably all heard about kind of the chat GPT craze that's been going on and the generative AI craze. So a lot of the sessions at CIL this year were about expanding on how AI, generative AI, and all these different tools are impacting libraries specifically. And one of the first trends that came out was how can you leverage artificial intelligence tools to be able to help in the search process. So if you're behind the reference desk and somebody walks in and asks you a question, or if you're in an academic library and you're supposed to be helping students with their research, a lot of libraries were afraid that these AI tools were going to take over their jobs, but mm -hmm. that's not necessarily true. If you as a librarian can learn how to leverage the tool and then help people understand how these AI tools should and should not be used. So I plucked out the super searcher tips thing because Mary Ellen Bates is at these, she goes to these conferences a lot and she's like, she's an awesome speaker and always has these amazing tools, tips and tricks. So this year she had like this whole, I loved how she actually just had the obligatory generative AI slides because she knows <laughs> she knows what people want. People are going to be wanting to hear that, yes. <laughs> so she also gives specific tips in here about uh, da, 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 da. one of my like one of the tools that she brought up was elicit.org, and this is one of several different types of tools that makes it easier to choose a topic and then do a broad level scan about which resources are available and out there and which resources are already pre-reviewed and legitimate that you should actually be using instead of just scanning the broad wide world web and you might get some crackpot talking about a topic in a weird way and so this kind of gives you like good choices and good stuff that you can use mm -hmm. and it also you can also upload different papers and different specific sources and just say, can you look at these specific sources and build me a summary page? Because that's what takes the longest when you're trying to write a paper. That's what takes the longest when you're trying to research is you're trying to go across multiple different sources and find out the commonalities and find out the different trends and find out what's going on in all these different sources. And this AI tool does it for you. But the problem that people of like academic world and library land and public libraries have been coming across is that you don't want to buy, like blindly trust this information because some tools they'll go out there and they'll claim that they'll actually give out citations that point you over to the correct source where they actually got the information from but if you actually click through and try to verify that that citation actually did link back to that segment of information that it claimed to connect to, some tools have a high accuracy rating and others do not. So some of these tools seem to be banking on the idea that people just aren't going to check. And so you actually wanna be able to, when you choose a tool and there's multiple different tools that will do the similar thing with peer reviewed literature and being able to build out summaries. Like another one is a for AI and that is like designed to help academic researchers be able to 
identify, summarize, and leverage different information sources more easily. So there's a ton of these tools, but be careful. Mm -hmm. So, and this presentation is linked over. She gives kind of these really awesome examples about different tools that you can use and how you can use them and how they work. So just scrolling through this and I don't know which other services Mary Ellen offers. She might even do consultations if you want to bring her in for a webinar or training or something, but she's awesome. And so I'm not going to go too deep into this because you can click it, see it for yourself. And so the next one is that as libraries are starting to leverage these tools, we also have to help the help people build out a new AI literacy because when people get lazy and they're unfamiliar with the topic, then they can start to rely on AI too much. So part of AI literacy is actually helping people understand what these AI tools are good for and what they're not. And another thing that when I say update policies down here, I give the example of a makerspace policy. And one of the things that we've been running into even like in the state here and a lot of the other makerspace folks that were at the conference and a lot of some of the other speakers were talking about what happens when someone wants to heat press a design onto a mug or heat press a design onto a t-shirt that they generated using an AI tool like Night Cafe. And mm -hmm. if it's a tool, those tools, they take examples from a, like examples of images from across the internet, and then they can replicate a style of painting. They can replicate all these different things. But all of that usually comes from a training set. So it's existing images and resources that come from that are online and available already, and it remixes it. Mm -hmm. But we don't, as the user, we don't know to what degree this was remixed. And we don't know that, like for example, I make um, book covers, I make book ornaments. Mm -hmm. So I actually use Night Cafe to be able to make a Grinch ornament. And the Grinch that was generated, it's not a Grinch that is readily, like you can't Google it and find a Grinch that looks exactly like it. But then there's a ethics thing because that Grinch is still recognizable as the Grinch. So, right. and that's a copyrighted character. So even though it's an offshoot of a copyrighted character, some laws will say that if you change that copyrighted character to a certain degree, you can still use it. Mm -hmm. But if it's still, and if you if you made the design yourself, there's flexibility in using it. But if an AI tool spit it out, can you still use it? And yeah, where's the so, line now? Yeah. So part of the updating the makerspace policy is if you're going to allow people to bring in their own images, you want to update your liability policy to say that if you get in trouble for copyright or if you get sued for a copyright violation, the library is not liable for that. Mm -hmm. We provided access to the equipment, but we can't control the images that are brought in. And you can also include an AI ethics training and some like copyright training to be able to help people understand what can and cannot be used and create guidelines. But just because the library creates guidelines and gives the education resources, we still don't want to be liable for how people actually use this stuff mm -hmm. because people might still accidentally do it without even thinking about it or not realize that they're violating a copyright or not realize how AI works. So they might not know that it's actually coming from stuff that already exists. And it's like, it might take little tiny little elements from the hundred different pictures and merge it into one. So you, they don't know. So I say balance skepticism with exploration and innovation because we want to encourage people to innovate. We want people to encourage people to use these tools, try new things, experiment and find what works. But we also want to introduce a little bit of skepticism in there to say, 
just because you can do a thing doesn't necessarily mean you should. And mm -hmm. that happens behind, that is effective behind the scenes in the library and for the patrons when the library is introducing these tools to the community for experimentation purposes. So I put in a link to this teaching AI literacy. So this education week kind of gives a bunch of different categorical categories and tips and tricks to be able to teach AI literacy. And this is for K through, like this, uh, this article was geared for K through 12, but when I read it, it's helpful for adults too. I mean, K through 12 is, you need the same basic information for every age range. So you might kind of adapt the different activities or the style that you teach it in, but the general concepts in this article are still gonna be the same. So if you're wondering what AI literacy is, give it a check. Mm -hmm. We have a question about AI since you're on it right now and talking about what people talked about. Um, so wants to know if anyone spoke about accidental bias in AI, for okay. example, the um, Google fiasco with historical queries. Yeah. The Google's AI tool, you know, having inaccurate <laughs> photos yeah. out there and claiming, yeah. So Are there any presentations there, about that or? So there actually was a whole session on the bias that is found in AI tools. And the funny thing is that that's not always the AI, the AI's fault. Mm -hmm. And I'll give a similar, it might even be the same example that the person who asked the question was thinking about. But the most common example that I think about is, um all like the larger companies like Facebook now, like Facebook now, Meta and Google and all these places, they were trying to build a human resources tool that would make it easier to filter out and select um, applicants. But all of that information was based on the previous decision that the human resource managers made. Mm -hmm. And so they found out that the AI tool was only recommending male candidates. And it's because the AI learned that all of the previous choices, the vast majority of them were men. So the AI tool was, I'm learning from your example. You're the one who gave me this example of data. And now I know this that you only want something. men. This must be an important yeah. criteria that I have to yeah. take into consideration. So it wasn't the AI's fault, but it was it was something that they learned unintentionally. It's something that kind of came out of it. Mm -hmm. And if most of the AI right now isn't fully regulated, and there's quite a few sessions that talked about that. And you've probably heard it yourself before, which is that if you don't have a regulatory authority or an oversight, that's reviewing how like the underworkings of the, how these tools work and mm -hmm. like the data set that it's based on and what's like the output that's being spit out versus are you actually representing the population correctly? Then do you really wanna be using this AI tool? Mm -hmm. So when the library is introducing this stuff, that's part of AI literacy is introducing what that bias looks like and how you can overcome it. So when you understand how the technology works and like the library can be introducing, um, like one of the games and gadgets tools that I use is introducing how machine learning works using cool gadgets or for free low cost online tools. And when you're doing that, if you just do the introductory activity and don't pair it with a discussion about AI ethics regulation and how this technology can actually be applied to real problems that are in your community, then it doesn't really do that much good. But I will get to that part in the next trend. <laughs> so the next one that came up was, there were quite a few sessions about how virtual reality and augmented reality were being used for storytelling. Like there was a really cool session that was about how virtual reality was being used to capture current moments and by capturing current culturally relevant moments in 360 video, 
or building out like an actual virtual world where you can interact with a replicated environment that snapshots what your world looks like right now, you're actually kind of creating a little slice of history because five, 10, 15, 20 years from now, that's gonna change. Your town might look different. The culture might look different. You might not, You might be losing a part of a generation because what as you like the grandkids want to know what the world looked like for their grandparents and the parents want to be able to pass down the history so that's actually virtual reality storytelling is adding in an extra element so that watching a video is one thing or watching a documentary is one thing but actually walking on the same streets that your grandparents walked on is powerful and the best way to do that is to be able to capture what your world looks like right now. And then there was a later session where we were kind of all sitting in a room and we were talking, there was a panel of um, virtual reality experts that were up on the stage. And we were kind of like, it was like a open discussion with um, some loose panel questions. And one of the questions that somebody asked was, how when you take a 360 video and then they make new tools but then that that video that you took the file format is no longer compatible with the new tools and that old file format is no longer viable how do you promote a tool as saying that you're going to be making history and that you're going to be making a tool that can be awesome and relevant 10 20 30 years from now but now the file format's not accessible. And how do you actually build that conversion tool so that you can archive this information? And then that actually turned into a new potential job for libraries because we're archivists, because we take all this stuff and we make it usable five, 10, 15, 20 years into the future. Mm -hmm. So as libraries are building that understanding of what virtual and augmented reality works, we start to see archiving is a problem. So um, one of the things that I recommended was that 360 videos are actually just a collection of like hundreds of thousands of images. So instead of uh, like saving that end result file format, if you save the images, the image file format is more likely to survive than the 360 video file format. So you can take those images and then put it into the new tool once the new, the new thing comes out. But then there was like a whole thing about funding. How do we actually, it costs a lot to store all these images. So then that turns into an archivist problem. And that turns into a future job that probably doesn't yet exist. When the need to archive and collect and store and digitize all this information comes about, who does it? And also who funds it. It's a whole thing. Oh, uh, yeah, but, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of a cool thing that came, like a cool discussion point that came out of the whole thing. And it'd be cool to see what comes of it. It'd also be cool if there were actually little subshoot interest groups that were like came out of the conference too, so that people could actually continue the conversation. But yeah. So like the other trend in here was that just like artificial intelligence, the metaverse also has ethics, cybersecurity, and a huge need for regulation too. And so some of the sessions in here were like some of the keynote sessions and some of the other XR sessions, a overarching trend was that we're also creating an all new different way for people to cyber bully each other because like it's a whole you can actually cyber bully an avatar too and it hurts just as bad mm. and you can also find um so when they're building out the metaverse and the icon on the right here is uh, like oculus is oculus now meta's metaverse but when they're building out these different worlds and they're building out these social media tools where people can actually walk around a town of their own creation Marketers can also go in there and start embedding their own logos and embedding their own 
information resources and you have a new channel for fake news. And it can be even more difficult to actually combat that fake news because it feels you're, like you're actually walking through the real world and that it's just something that belongs there. So it's training people to say that just because this is a virtual world and you see this branding and you see this information splash and you see this, you still need to use the same evaluation tools to find out if this information is real or not. And because you're in a virtual world that's also over, it might be overloading your system, it might be um, stressing you out, it might be doing whatever. And you need to be careful that you're still making decisions, even like good decisions, even though you might be overloaded by the environment that you're in. You can might be seeing a dinosaur that's running down the street next to you, and you might be seeing a plane flying in overhead. But then how do you actually like take the time to pause, slow down, and say, is what I'm being thrown at right now actually something that's true and something that I should listen to or not? Mm -hmm. And how do you actually carry over the same thing that we do for um, basically teaching fake news, how to evaluate information resources that translates over into the metaverse. And then you also have an AI powered metaverse where they're starting to build, they're using generative AI to actually build out the 3D objects and kind of those like 3D worlds that you're actually going to be walking around in. And those 3D worlds also have to be based on you need a training set. They're based on stuff that already exists out there. So what are the ethics and regulations around building out a virtual world that might be based on a real world? And how do you protect the art, like the rights of the artist who actually generated some of the original stuff? And do you have to lock down the source of the 3D models where these generative AI tools can come from? So mm. how do you protect the rights of the artists and the people that spent all this time learning how to build these amazing skills and still protect those rights, but still be able to democratize the metaverse and be able to say, you can still use AI powered tools to build out your virtual world. Mm. Like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> How do you? <laughs> right, you know? So then the next thing is all of these trends, the metaverse, AI, and all these different and other emerging technologies like using sensors to be able to enhance your environment, um, data analysis and robotics and drones, all this stuff is changing the way that we live, work, and do things. So this is also changing the way library jobs look. So there might be a time in the future where you have shelf bot and you have shelf bot that's actually going through and shelving the books instead of having a 16 year old shelver that goes and does it for you. And honestly, I used to be a shelver back when I was an undergrad. So if a robot took that over, I wouldn't mind. But then what mm -hmm. does that little shelver actually do? And where does the new entry level point for what a librarian starts off and enters into when they're actually diving into the library world? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've noticed before and what I know that a lot of other people have been talking about is one of the things that makes like fledgling librarians leave the leave library land is that the entry level stuff is boring. There's nothing that actually challenge them, challenges them to learn and grow, and there's not always an avenue to actually build out new skills, because like the old guard is always saying, well, we had to spend two plus years like working as a shelver, and then you've worked up from a shelver to be going behind the circ desk, and then you're always on check-in duty at the start of the shift, and you have to like wade through the bin. And then you have to get assigned all the boring level tasks that no one else wants to do. And when you have a library structure that works like that, you lose people because they get bored and they're looking to be challenged elsewhere. So if you have some automation tools that are taking over these easy, simple tasks, 
you need to find a new way to actually onboard and get these people engaged so that they actually want to stay in library land. And I almost left library land because I was freakishly bored. And that was like one of the first libraries that I worked at in behind a circ desk. And I actually don't work in a physical library anymore. I work in, I'm basically admin. So that is more of a challenging environment than some of the old circ desk that I used to do. <laughs> but if you were to actually give those, like if you give those same people the opportunity to do outreach and you gave those same mm -hmm. people an opportunity to actually say, I know you're new, I know you're just getting into this, but what if you were to actually help us design what our new service is going to look like? What if you help us do, like help us lead a program? What if you help us like set up the system and now you can actually shadow and learn this so that you're not bored out of your skill? Mm -hmm. And you can actually have a pathway to actually build into the skills instead of saying, getting caught behind the red tape that says, I'm at this level, that means that I can't do any of the tasks that are at this next next hierarchy level. So what these emerging technology tools are doing is messing with the hierarchy. And some people don't like that because it's sort of like these AI tools, these old easy tasks aren't there anymore. But that challenges the hierarchy because you can't relegate people to these old boring tasks anymore because they don't exist. And now you're saying, now you have to say these entry level people, the baseline for entry level is changing. And now that's a threat to the people that were already in those positions. So they're trying to reject the technology that could be making that change. And by rejecting the technology that could be making the change, the library loses because then people start going to competing services because they can't get what they need out, like from the library itself. Why would you use an antiquated service? So that's kind of what's happening to a lot of libraries right now is that they're afraid to use the technology or they can't see what would be next. So mm. that's part of what innovation is. When you build an understanding of how this technology works, you understand that something like a prompt engineer librarian is possible. Because even though generative AI means that you can go to a tool like Night Cafe or Mid Journey, and you can type in real, just the typical sentence, and like it'll spit out something that'll look somewhat like that. But what people don't know is that there's actually an art to building out that prompt. When right. I use Night Cafe, in the beginning, it took me maybe 40 to 60 prompts to be able to get the image to actually look the way that I wanted it to look. Ah. But once you get used to how the system works, maybe it only takes five or 10 prompts. And then the cost of using the system lowers because most of those systems, especially Night Cafe, they go on a credit-based system so that you spend a certain number of credits to be able to get an image. It's one credit for each different image. So what used to be $40 is now five or 10. And then as you get better and better at it, that cost lowers. And then the prompt engineer librarian, and this was actually, this was brought up in Chad Marin's um, session. Yeah. One of them, on the yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So he he was he talked all about the concept of prompt engineers and he said what if there's one day a prompt engineer librarian and I was like yes what if <laughs> and so what if you actually had a librarian that was really good at this stuff and really good at doing this stuff in context like they were able to do prompt engineering for um understanding climate action or they did prompt engineering for building out instructional design tools or prompt engineering for videography it's and, like now when people who know that and it may happen to you i know it happens to me and my sister are both librarians um yeah. our parents or aunts or uncles or someone will call us or email us and say can you use your 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 librarian your Google foo, your librarian skills, <laughs> look this up for me. 
because we've learned you know how to do boolean search how google works how to find the yeah. right answers by typing in the right words rather than just randomly typing in things and you know that they yeah. are thinking of and i'm like you know and in our skills we've just learned that Either we were taught it about boolean searching and how it works but then just through experience of well i know what it's going to spit out when i put this in so i'm going to do this instead yeah um it's and what if you had your entry level people like your high schoolers and your early level college people that are already familiar with ai tools what if you had them learning some of this instead of just doing these other tasks mm -hmm. and like that's kind of driving that innovation change and figuring out what's next yeah and so the next part that comes in here and i already talked about this a little bit which is how do you manage this kind of changing environment because you're going to have people like this actually happened here at the commission like when covid started um mm -hmm. we had to get used to being able to work remotely and in person sometimes and that was like a it's a different way of managing it's a different way of it's adapting to that remote world and being able to find the best of both worlds but now you add in the layer of also operating in virtual reality and operating in all these different platforms and how do you make people make sure that people are actually doing what they promised they're doing and also building out that trust that yeah that's happening and then also being able to support people and being able to innovate and change in the way that actually works best for them. So we're adding like a, as that metaverse comes in and as like AI takes on that charge, that the way that that dynamic works is changing. And then, so that brings over to both management and advocates and library staff they all have to learn new and different skills to be able to take on these new challenges so that means that there were a lot of sessions about how the digital divide is changing again so mm -hmm. there was one about there was one cool session that talked about the gigabit toolkit and the gigabit mm -hmm. toolkit is basically how to get fiber into all these different communities and how to make sure that we have that baseline infrastructure Right. You can't connect or use a virtual reality headset if your fiber is no good. No. If you don't have the right internet speed, you can't use the sensors that are out there. And if you don't have the right internet speed and a solid connection, you can't use the, you can't work with the, like the data and the tools that are shaping the way that we all work and live. So then you get left behind. So, mm -hmm. We have people that are just, we have some communities that are just getting connected online. They're just getting fiber and now they're learning computer and device basics. But now we also can't ignore AI literacy. We can't ignore this emerging technology and innovation skills. And we have to be able to sustain the technology that already exists and kind of bring people up to speed so that they're not completely left behind. But we also have to encourage that innovation and kind of the leveraging the tools of the future and shaping what that future is going to look like. And that all means that that digital divide is just getting wider and wider and wider. Mm -hmm. So that also means that a lot of libraries are finding new and innovative models to close that digital divide because people are realizing that a lot of these computer basic resources, um, it's an easy way it started out in the early days of digital literacy that there, there would be about 60 different libraries and each one of them would make their own individual tutorial about how to use mm -hmm. social media, how to use, um, how to set up a computer, how to do basic cybersecurity, how to do passwords. But now they're saying, why did we ever do that? Why don't we all just work together and make one or two tutorials and then share them? And like you've probably seen that in the Public Library Association's digital learn platform, where they're just making that same set of inf like that same set of tutorials. And you also have like tech boomers and all this stuff. So don't do computer basics. Don't keep reinventing the wheel. Don't keep making tutorials. Don't keep doing this. 
mm -hmm. shift over to AI literacy and just say that we're never going to close this digital divide if we keep staying back here. We have to shift over up here and trust that these resources already exist. We just need to show, show people what is happening. And the toolkits to be able to, if you go to the Computers and Libraries website and then go over to that gigabit toolkit, like you'll find the session about that, that exists already. You don't need to worry about it. Just yes. use it. Librarians <laughs> are all about sharing you know, resources for your um, the people who use your library and we share them to ourselves too. Yeah. Yep. And so part of that community building is building the community among librarians too. Like I just found, I went to a webinar yesterday that was from, that was through Maryland. And I think it was the MD Tech Connect. I might be wrong about that name, but I had been thinking forever about starting like an emerging technology interest group among librarians. And then I, then I took a survey at the end of their session and it said, if you're interested in joining our AI and emergency, uh, AI and emerging technology group, add your email here. And I was like, yes. So, there you go. There it is. <laughs> yeah. So it's even mapping out the resources among librarians to find out what's going on. Because mm -hmm. if we don't talk to each other effectively, then we're going to keep reinventing the wheel and we're never going to actually get up to where we need to be. I always borrow the phrase from our director here in the Nebraska Library Commission, but he and I'm um, that he says um, R and D that rip off and duplicate, and he means right. it in the nicest way. And and it's like yes, please do rip off and duplicate my thing. I right. just, yeah, yeah that, I I put it out there so everyone can see. That's why we do these and these webinars too here, showing you yeah. what libraries are doing so you can replicate it in your own. Contact them, get more info. Don't start from scratch. You don't have to. Yeah. It's, and that's why if there was like a conference series that actually mapped these communities that were continuing this conversation ever, they would be like the conference superpower. <laughs> <laughs> but so, and I already, t so, oh, I have seven minutes left, so we'll just kind of jump along here. So I already, a little late, so we'll give you a little, you know. Yeah. So I already talked a little bit about how we can start operating alongside AI, but it's also a lot of the communities that I talk to now are saying that we're not focusing on artificial intelligence, virtual reality, the metaverse, or any of this stuff. One, because we only found out last week that some of this stuff existed. And two, there's not a lot of easy to use and find resources that will help us do the training for this stuff. Mm. So part of what libraries are starting to work on and what some a lot of educational institutions are starting work started working on is hitting the easy button on actually giving these introductory exposure to all of this stuff. So the next thing that came in is so one of my sessions in here was the impact ecosystems is how do we actually help libraries move from helping people gain exposure to technology through like a makerspace activity and through like bringing in like a guest speaker or hosting a workshop about artificial intelligence or about robotics and drones and actually not stopping at just that workshop and saying, okay, now let's explore some of the compute community needs. And what the really big challenge there is, is that there are usually a ton of different community needs, but people don't actually know on the large scale what the greatest, highest need issues there are. Like for example, here in Lincoln, um, affordable housing, childcare and Oh, what was the third one? Transportation. Those were th like three of the biggest issues, but those are such big issues that they need to be broken down into little bitty subtopics so people can actually manage it. And then they want to connect over to the organizations that are doing stuff and understand what's going on within the spaces so that they can actually say, well, the, once you understand the problem, then you can take the technology that you just learned and put the two together to connect the dots. But if you only focus on introducing this technology, 
and you don't introduce that problem component, then you're just going to have a lot of people that make 3D printed Octopi in your 3D printer, which totally what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the things with the impact ecosystem is how do you go from tech exposure and understanding problems to actually building out a solution that makes your community stronger. So that was what one of my sessions was all about was building out like a full innovation ecosystem within your library or within your, not specifically within your library, within the community. And I know that um, Chad Marin and St. Pete's, he does like a lot of that innovation ecosystem stuff, mm -hmm. but there's no innovation mapping system that actually maps out the organizations from start to finish and helps be like people guide through that whole process. And there's like, it's understanding what's going on and then finding out what can be done in the future and what the library's role in that innovation ecosystem is and how you can teach tech for good and introduce technology with purpose so that it doesn't just start and end with one session. Not just and, a, a shiny thing for just to say, ooh, yeah. I touched, I did a 3D printer thing and then yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, and that was what uh, some of the techie librarians and I were talking after some of the sessions and that's been like a recurring problem where libraries will invest all this money into like laser cutters and 3D printers and all this technology and it doesn't really go anywhere. Like some people will magically already have a problem in mind and then they'll use the technology for that purpose. But most like a lot of the communities I ran into is like People are going to my laser cutter sessions and they're learning how to build a garden stake because that was the recommended activity on the laser cutters website. But then after they finished that activity, no one actually came back to use the technology tool. Mm -hmm. But when you start expanding it out and saying that here's an innovation library about how laser cutters are being used across industries and how they're using laser cutters to improve community gardens and build out labeling systems and you can build a community driven smart garden now this technology has uses purpose. of it yep. yeah and now once you understand the purpose and what you want to do with it it's actually easier to build out the skills that are necessary to do that specific task instead of just doing a hodgepodge of tutorials and exploratory tools across a wide range of things you're actually learning with purpose in a way that makes your community stronger instead of just, I got a shiny garden steak and now I know that this is cilantro. <laughs> and, you know, although it is nice to know like which parsley is which parsley, but still. <laughs> you know. And so that is another, they're also building out different ways to actually bring people together and build the community to get people talking about the problem, the shared problems that are facing our communities, because you can do that in person, you can do that um, over Zoom, you can actually even do it using spatial IO and virtual reality and bring people together that way. But then how do you harness the information that was gathered in each one of these different modes and put it into one shared portal? And that's what libraries are starting to do, is they're starting to actually gather from all these different sources and plunk it all in one spot so people can find it. It's information access. Yep. And then um, some of my other favorite sessions were, I think it's iLead that does it, but they're talking about how we can change the way that we support innovation. And there was a cool session that was about saying that you want a better future and saying that you want to stop a stronger library system is one thing but unless you can actually tangibly imagine how people act how people behave how you want people like what this world actually looks like you're never actually going to get there because you don't have a tangible set of goals so there's all these splash images about be the change you want to see in the world build a better future libraries are the anchor but unless you can say tangibly what that looks like, you just have a cool image that you just made on Canva. 
So how do you actually turn this into a reality and how do you change your leadership practices, management practices and employee practices to be able to drive this innovation and make that change actually happen? So that was cool. Check out the iLead sessions if you go on the computer and library website. And I, they also have a separate leadership track. So if you ever do want to go to the session, to these to the conference in person, there's also a separate track where you can learn all about that stuff, which is cool. And then, so my last little trend that I'll kind of cover somewhat quickly is the, I promised that I'd talk about the diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, yeah, this is not a problem if we go along. We've done this if any of you have ever watched many of our Encompass lives. We oftentimes go over our official hour and um, that's okay. I want to make sure we get through everything that our presenters want to talk about and Amanda today. And if you all have any questions, comments, thoughts, get type into the questions section now as you're thinking of them or anything you wanted to know about. Um, we'll make sure we get everything covered and all your questions answered. Um, if some of you only allotted an hour for today's show, that's fine. We are recording the whole thing. So if you do need to leave now, um, that's fine. Um, you'll be able to watch the recording um, later at your convenience. Cool. So the first DI trend is um, Probably a, it's a group that I never actually think about that it's act, but it's actually very like very near and dear to my heart, which is there was a memory care initiative. So it's mm -hmm. how can libraries support people that are suffering from Alzheimer's, dementia, and those like aging patrons that I know here in Nebraska we have a huge aging population, and my grandpa actually suffered from Alzheimer's before he passed away. And that was probably about maybe 10, 15 years ago. So this memory care initiative in here, it actually has a collection of support resources that it's like toolkits, guides, resources, and tangible things that libraries can use to actually support uh, memory care programs and how to like build out the partnerships and support this population. And so this is the Alzheimer's, dementia, aphasia, and memory care support. Hmm. And so at the actual session, they brought in a bunch of these different gadgets and memory care tools. And there was actually one cool one that it's a ro like a robotic cat. And it's actually like a, like a tactile thing that you can actually hold and pet like a real cat. And it hmm. kind of offers that, like the same support that you get from a pet but it's something that you don't need to remember to feed. <laughs> and, you know, and it's also, it gives like that connection that people are lacking in a like a retirement home or people that a lot of libraries actually have retirement homes that bus people into the library so that they have an outing. So having some of the tech gear and gadgets that um, available in the library during this, these sessions, or as like a make and take kit, not a make and take kit, it's mostly just a borrow and bring back kit. But you can check out, like you can set up a lending library where people can check out these different memory games and these different things. And at home caregivers can use them with their loved ones or you can send them over to a nursing home or a community center or any number of these different places. So there's all these different ways that you can support this underrepresented population in cool ways so that's a cool resource to check out and their session was i got to pet their robot cat so always mm -hmm. a win <laughs> and so another kind of trend that came up in the web design and redesign like track was how do you actually design both digital and physical spaces to support um, both cognitive disability like Usually when we think of web accessibility, blind, visually impaired usually comes up first. So you think about the contrast and can a screen reader read it and does it pass the W3 schools test for accessibility? But not everything, everyone thinks about like designing for cognitive disabilities. Like if you are overwhelmed by certain colors or if you are like, there's different design techniques that are better for that than other things. And so 
either Googling it or going through and finding the sessions. And I say that because I don't remember which sessions have actually been actively uploaded onto the site. So some sessions happened, but not all of them have an uploaded slide. So let me check. Um, and Krista, it sounds like you might be in the same page too. Would you mind putting this presentation slide in here or the link in here in the chat? Oh, yeah, sure. Presentations. Um, so then this is something that will be updated, up, uh, hopefully updated as more presenters submit. Yep. And so there's like a, it seems like a good number of these have already been uploaded. But if you jump into their web path, and I think web presence was on Thursday. So this would have been covered in part of this track. Mm -hmm. And some of the, some of the concepts that I picked up were actually in a computers and libraries from last year or two. I mean, it all, I, I learned it, it got there. <laughs> <laughs> so there were also some resource coverage for some of the entrepreneurship and makerspace tracks also focused in on representing refugee, like entrepreneurship. Like here in Lincoln, we have the Echo Collective that actually supports specifically supports refugee and entrepreneurs but not all communities have that yeah. and it's actually a different skill set that refugee entrepreneurs need to build because some of them actually need to earn like learn english and like life skills in their new environment alongside building out entrepreneurship skills so they need different support resources to be able to accomplish that and some libraries are stepping in to fill that gap, or they might be partnering with an entrepreneurship group, and then, like the library might offer the like the language learning and the um, life skills, while well, their partner service offers like the entrepreneurship resources. So there's different models that are starting to come together to support that. And then there's a ton for supporting not just incarcerated individuals but their families as well. And the last one that I'll talk about is um, on the right here, this is a braille coding card. So mm -hmm. what some people don't know is that, yes, blind people can indeed use computers. They do it all the time. I used to work at Beyond Vision and I was the only sighted person in the room for a couple of years. And I basically set up training programs to help library to help libraries to help blind visually impaired people get caught up to speed on call center programs. So I would design a call center program and I would run the admin and then train them to use the platform. So I had to build out accessible training. Mm -hmm. And there are actually blind visually impaired coders. One of the coders that was on the team that designed this TCN platform they learned all these accessibility skills and they also knew some coders that actually are blind visually impaired. So if you have younger students that actually want to learn coding, there are more resources that are becoming available so that they can do that. Mm -hmm. And Kike's, um, Kaibot is one of those. This is mm -hmm. a braille coding card that works with the Kai's clan robot, or not the Kai's clan, the Kaibot which is like an entry level robot that teaches coding basics. Mm -hmm. So now the blind visually impaired kids can actually work alongside the sighted kids because the sighted kids can use the card regularly and the blind visually impaired can use the Braille side of it. And they're still both getting the same, like similar experience and same information. And there are more gadgetries that's coming out that's actually teaching, that's actually reaching this audience. So, cool. Yeah. If you want to know more about Kaibot, they were on Encompass Live a few months ago with Amanda. Yes. So you can check in our um, show archives uh, for that yeah. previous session. 
And there's a bunch more accessibility tech, but I wanted to focus in on the cool new stuff that's yeah. shiny and burly. But so that I'll probably leave it at that. I went a little over time, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. All right. Um, yeah. Um, so I don't see any other new ones come in yet, but does anybody have anything else you want to ask of Amanda? Ask about what um, um, anything she's talked about, anything you were hoping to see about, um, hear about. Um, as I said, this isn't every single thing that happened at CIL because there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, just highlighting um, a few things that caught her attention. So type into the questions section of the GoToWebinar interface. Um, I did share out the link directly to the presentations page as well. Um, there's it. there's Amanda's contact info. You can always email her with any questions, anything you want to talk to her about, anything with computers and libraries or tech, um, anything. Um, that's what she's here at the Library Commission to help you out with some of your um, tech issues that you might have or technical questions um, about new things going on in libraries and, and, the, and technology. Um, the slides, as I said, will be available as well. I've got the link for that. So when the recording goes up, those will be made available too. Um, usually it takes, let's see, today is kind of the end of the day. By the end of the day tomorrow, the recording will be up. And um, everyone who attended today's session and registered for today's show will get an email directly from me letting you know that it is, um, that it's ready, that it's available for you to watch. And I will stop showing the screen if you want to do the yeah. closeout. Yeah, I'll cl I'll switch over to my pages now here. Um, you. There we go. So this is the session page for today. We got some people saying thank you, thank you, ladies. You're welcome. Um, this is the event page for today's show. This will be used to create the record archive page, and we do have a link to the um, computers and libraries website here, which. Um, Right here is that link at the top for presentations. So you'll be able to get to that right from uh, when I send out the information about the recording and get all of access to all the slides for anyone else who presented at computers and libraries. Uh, when the recording is available, we also push it out into our social media. We have a Facebook page. You can see we've got a link here. Um, it's over here. Or we post if you so if you like to use Facebook, give us a like. Um, we post various here's a thing reminder to log in today's show, announcing about the show changes, and then here's a recording and post about recordings from the previous shows. So we always push out onto our Facebook page and onto the Library Commission's Twitter account using the hashtag #EncompLive, a little abbreviation for our show name. I'll show you over here. Um, this is our main Encompass Live page. Um, if you type in Encompass Live, the name of our show in your search engine of choice, you'll come up with a links to our main page and our archive page. Um, these are upcoming shows for May. Um, down here is underneath them is a link to our archive. So this is where today's show will be. The most recent one will be at the top of the list here because these are um, oldest ones at the bottom. So there'll be a link um, to this and then they'll have two links like this one from last week there was a recording and slides so you have those two links will be added that you have access to um while i'm here i'll show you um this is our um full show archives and you can search them if you're looking for if we see if we see if we've done a show on a particular topic you might be interested in um you can search the full show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want to that is because this is our full show archives and i'm not going to scroll all the way down because you can see this is a really huge page but um, this goes back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was in January 2009. So we were in our 16th year of the show. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Epic. Um, but uh, so do pay attention um, to the original broadcast date when you watch anything. Um, many of the shows will be fine to watch and they'll stand the test of the time, still so be good, useful information. Um, but some things will become old and outdated. Resources and services may have changed, changed drastically. Um, links might not work anymore. Some things might have no longer exist. Uh, people may work at different institutions from when they, they actually presented for us. Um, so just pay attention to that original broadcast date whenever you do watch any of our archives. But um, we will, as long as we have somewhere to keep all of these, we'll always have them available out there. Um, it's something libraries do, keep things for historical purposes. Um, so, uh, and right now that's all on our YouTube channel. So, um, as long as we have a place to keep them, we will always have them available. 
All right. Is it? <laughs> uh, any last minute words, Amanda? Um, I just gave a lot of words, so not that yes. I can think <laughs> of. Yeah. All right. Um, Amanda, we back with us um at the end of May again. Um, when was the last Wednesday in May? May twenty ninth. Um. We'll be, um, she'll be back and we'll see what topic we're going to have for that. We don't know yet. Always a fun question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but it, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's in our calendar. So you do want to get registered for it. You can go right ahead and you'll find out what the um, topic will be as soon as um, we decide that. Um, but our next uh, show, um, so that'll wrap, it up, wrap us up for today. Um, good to see you, Amanda, and good to see everyone here. Um, here's our May shows, and we'll be having more shows filling in on the calendar. We're here every Wednesday morning, um, and I'm usually working with getting new things added. So for now, I've got the next two weeks um, set. Um, next week, we'll be talking about one book for Nebraska kids and teens um, for the 2024. Um, many people have a one book, one state, or one book, one community um, programs. We have that here in Nebraska as well. We actually did that last week, talking about our one book, one Nebraska. But we also have a program for kids and teens, same idea, but a specific book that we choose for our kids and then a specific book for the older teens. And Sally Snyder, our coordinator of Children and Young Adult Library Services, and Amy Owen, one of our information services librarians, will be here to talk about the program and the books for 2024. So if you're interested in hearing about what we're doing here in Nebraska <coughs> about that, definitely sign up for that. And then the week after that, we're talking about public library accreditation. This is a program we do here in Nebraska for our public libraries. I'm in charge of that. I'm doing a little intro to the process of the, the program. Um, it opens up for new libraries or re-accrediting libraries on July 1st. So that's a little uh, heads up for that. So other than that, thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you, Amanda, for telling us everything about everything we ever wanted to know about computers and libraries this year. <laughs> And I uh, hope we will see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>